I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we look into the shadowy world of Russian oil. With Moscow threatened by sanctions, our economics reporter Louis Ashworth explains how, from clandestine transfers to tankers going dark, Russia continues to export oil. Before that, however, we discuss yesterday's visit to Kyiv of European leaders and hear more about the Americans fighting for Ukraine who were captured by Russian forces. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 17th of June, day 114. Today I'm joined by assistant comment editor Francis Durnley, Telegraph correspondent Colin Freeman, and economics reporter Louis Ashworth. Francis, can we start with you? Yesterday saw uh, an incredibly important visit to Kyiv from uh, leaders of four European nations, France, Germany, Italy and Romania. Uh, What happened and what's been the fallout? Yes, well, breaking news on that. Um, So we're just hearing that the European Commission has accepted the desire of Ukraine to have it for its um, bid for EU membership, EU candidacy to be fast tracked. So they are now a step closer to membership of the European Union, which has long been a goal of uh, President Zelensky for for obvious reasons, um, seeking the protection of of um, the European Union and, and being and forging closer ties with its with its powers, um, that's been granted uh, literally within the last sort of twenty minutes or so. Um, the issue that he will have long term, of course, is this is only the beginning of what is a protracted process. So, in order for Ukraine to become a member of the European Union, it will require all twenty seven nations to agree and um, that process will take years almost certainly there's going to be a meeting next week in brussels to really formally trigger it and 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 formally launch the ascension process but i think we can expect there to be certain objections raised by certain european powers not least hungary which as we've spoken about many times on the podcast has a more critical view of uh, the Western response to Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and so this is by no means, a, I think, a certainty in the short term, but it does speak of the intention of uh, the European Union and the European Commission to bring Ukraine into the fold and, and closer to the Union. And obviously it sends a symbolic message about the, how they see Ukraine's future. And Emmanuel Macron, the French president, claimed that France will be a uh, mediating power in in future negotiations. Um, How did Ukraine react to that? What what do we think that might mean? Well, of course, Emmanuel Macron has become under a lot of criticism in recent weeks due to some of his comments uh, around not humiliating Russia um, and has obviously, since even prior to the conflict beginning, was uh, in dialogue with Vladimir Putin um, and was sort of trying to find a means of of avoiding the war by perhaps granting certain concessions to Russia on certain issues that were considered fundamental um, to Ukrainian sovereignty. So he's come under a lot of flack and I think we can read into his remarks that he still sees France as playing a crucial role in whatever future peace deal will be struck. But not only that, I think France has actually gone considerably further um, uh, in its sort of robust remarks against Russia. So, um, and I quote, we stand with the Ukrainians without ambiguity. Ukraine must resist and win, as the remarks are by President Macron clearly trying to draw a line under the criticism, as I say. Um, but 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 further to that, um, he has uh, been really uh, some of the, the, the remarks that have been coming out of the of the French um, foreign embassy is, is essentially uh, that the, they 
believe that there shouldn't be any now concessions granted at all um, to Russia, which almost sounds like the sort of British line um, uh, being reiterated. So I would say that, that it seems that France are at the moment sort of having a rather inconsistent position. Um, and I don't know what President Zelensky is, is making of this. But just on that point, um, there has been a, a lot of speculation that the... Uh, the, the meeting yesterday was perhaps rather hostile is the wrong word, rather tense, perhaps, between um, Olaf Scholz, President Macron and President Zelensky. But the statement from Zelensky that has been put out um, is, is, I think, a bit more upbeat than we might have expected from from some of the whispers we were hearing yesterday. So I'll read a few quotes from the statement because it's quite interesting. So. This gives a measure, a measure, I think, of, of the mood um, and at least how Ukraine wants the world to interpret um, the events of the last 24 hours. So he says, quote, today is a truly historic day. Ukraine has felt the support of four powerful European states at once and in particular support for our movement to the European Union. Italy, Romania, France and Germany are with us. He goes on. It was important for me to hear from the leaders another fundamental thing. They agree that the end of the war and peace for Ukraine must be exactly as Ukraine sees them. Now, as I say, that is a divergence of opinion um, than I think we were hearing from President Macron in recent weeks. President Nancy goes on. In general, my impression of the meeting is positive. All leaders understand why negotiations to end the war are not underway exclusively because of Russia's position, which is only trying to intimidate everyone in Europe and continue the destruction of our state. They do not want to look for a way to peace. This is an aggressor who must decide for himself that the war must end. We will continue to fight until we guarantee our state full security and territorial integrity. So it just gives a flavour there, as I say, of, of, um, of the Ukrainian response to what took place yesterday um, and in, in recent um, hours, of course, as well, in, in, in certain additional remarks that have been made by, um, by both the, Euro by the European powers and, and, and President Zelensky's ministry as well. So very quickly, thank you very much, Francis. Before I come to Louis and Colin for your updates, um, Francis, obviously you've been following, we've been following this, this conflict since the, the, this invasion since, since the very beginning. Um, what, quickly, what do you make of this meeting? It sounds like it's gone quite well for, for Ukraine and Ukraine supporters. Is that fair? I think it's too early to say. And the reason I say that is I, because there's, we don't know yet what real com hard conversations were taking place behind closed doors. As I say, we are seeing at the moment what the United, the, what the European Union and what um, President Zelensky wants the world to see, which is this sort of unified front. Um, but I think that there will have been some very, very tense conversations, as I say, taking place between President Zelensky and some of these um, powers, because... As I say, it is not a consistent position that we have seen, particularly from Olaf Scholz and from Emmanuel Macron, um, about the level of support that they are willing to give Ukraine. This is not only about the munitions being supplied, um, tanks, weapons, etc., but on this idea, as I say, about principles around um, what the end game looks like, as it were, what peace looks like for Europe. And I think, as I say, we understand, and certainly there are good reasons for thinking this, given the remarks of, 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 of President Macron himself, that, that they are willing to see certain concessions to Russia that, uh, that in peace talks that will enable peace and the restoration of, of course, food security, energy security and, and, and cost of living security um, for Europe and the wider world. So um, I think I wouldn't be surprised if we, there are some leaks, I suppose, or some some um, additional information that comes out in, in the coming days about some of the difficult conversations that will have no, no doubt be taking place. But I think we can say that it's a positive development in the sense that they have left this meeting with a unified um, principle, at least. And not only that, um, I, I think, you know, of course, from the Ukrainian perspective, being brought closer into the European fold, the European Union, which has, as I say, been granted now, um, will be seen certainly as a very positive step forward. Thank you very much, Francis, for that. Um, Colin Freeman, can I turn to you now? You broke uh, an exclusive story with The Telegraph about the uh, two American soldiers who have been captured by the Russians. Can you tell us about 
that story and what what any updates and the, the latest news we ha- we have on that yes um this was a story that we broke um uh, a couple of days ago now um uh this came from a somebody i i spoke to in ukraine uh who was fighting as a volunteer an american volunteer with um a, a larger group of foreign volunteers uh, serving with the ukrainian regular forces they were up in Kharkiv or near Kharkiv uh, and they got into a fierce firefight with some uh, Russian troops. And during the course of that, it was all very chaotic, but during the course of that, um, two of their um, comrades, two Americans, um, both ex-military uh, men, um, uh, went missing in action. Um, their comrades feared that they had been kidnapped or t- rather taken prisoner because um, a f- few hours later, um, uh, a claim went out on a Russian telegram channel used by pro-Russian groups that they had uh, taken custody of two American prisoners of war. Um, It wasn't entirely clear as of two days ago what had happened to them. There was widespread fears that they had been taken, um, but no actual proof. Um, We still don't have hard proof, but um, this morning a picture emerged of the two men, or certainly very much appears to be them, unless it's some sophisticated fake. Um, again, on a pro-Russian social media channel, um, there it shows the two of them in army fatigues, um, with, uh, apparently with their hands bound behind their backs and being uh, being transported away in a in a in an army truck. So it would appear to be um, confirmation or something pretty close to that that um, these guys are now in Russian military custody. And do we have a sense of what may happen to them? We, we had the British uh, soldiers captured um, last week, who, who was, well, two weeks ago, who had been sentenced to, to death. Um, do we fear that the same may happen to, to, these, to, to these American soldiers? And, and also, a, a further question, do, we have a sense, do you have a sense of talking to, to foreign volunteers, what, what their morale is like now? If, if, if this is the fate that awaits them, if, if they are captured, that's, that's pretty terrifying. Um, we, we don't know what's going to happen to these guys, no. Um, uh, as you say, we, we already have uh, a number of British volunteers who are already in uh, the custody of um, uh, Russian forces or pro-Russian forces. Um, the, th- As I understand it, the three British volunteers who've been captured are all um, in the custody of pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine who have their own separate jurisdiction and a court in eastern Ukraine has already sentenced two of them to death. Um, given the sway that Moscow has in those pro-Russian separatist republics, um, uh, it, it would be likely that Moscow will have the final say in whatever happens to them. It, there has been speculation that they might be uh, included in some big prisoner swap, whereby Russia swaps um, a load of prisoners that it holds of Ukrainians and um, uh, foreign volunteers fighting with the Ukrainian forces. Um, uh, in exchange for a, a group of Russian prisoners of war. But we don't know whether that's definitely going to happen. And, of course, with the Western volunteers, it's a, a bit of a special case because um, right, Moscow will know that they can use them as extra leverage against Britain and America. Um, uh, as regards um, morale among the foreign volunteers, I spoke to one last night. Um, uh, he, was, uh, he, he did not mention... Um, the, uh, the 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 capture of uh, of these guys. Um, to be honest, I'm not even sure if he was aware of it. The, these guys are all in the, the the ones who are fighting are very much in the thick of it. Um, if I'm honest, I don't think it will put many of them off. Um, for those who are actually really out there fighting, they're already risking their lives um, in very intense combat on a daily basis. So if they get caught, um, then I suppose that's one better than being get, than, than getting killed. Thanks so much, Colin, for that. Uh, Francis, uh, before we move on, Francis and Louis, do you have any questions for Colin about this case? I mean, it, it, it's absolutely fascinating and quite terrifying. Well, it's just fascinating hearing hearing Colin's perspective on this. I mean, do we do we get a sense of how many similar cases may be ongoing in the long term? Um, yeah, some of them have not been publicised. Um, you, you hear anecdotally people saying, oh, those talk that another American guy got taken down in this part of um, 
uh, Ukraine or that um, you know that there, there are a few other, certainly a few rumors of a few other cases around. Um, for example, it's been reported in the last couple of days in the wake of this um, this story that we've done that there's a third American guy being taken prisoner of war, but nobody at this stage seems to know who he is, not in public anyway. Um, uh, and I, 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 the, the estimates as to how many Britons and Americans are out here vary wildly. You hear some people saying thousands, you say, hear others saying no more than a couple of hundred. Um, uh, so it, it, it's it's very hard to say. What, what what does often happen though is that if somebody is is taken prisoner, um, their comrades often decide not to talk about it for one reason or another. In this case that we've reported on in the last couple of days, one of their comrades wanted it out there. Um, the reason he wanted it made public, he said, was because he he wanted the world to be aware that. Uh, these guys um, had probably been captured alive and what he was hoping to head off was the prospect of them being quietly killed by whichever frontline unit um, was holding them. He wanted it to be passed, the news to be communicated up to the top of the chain, as it were, so that the Kremlin knew that these guys were in Russian hands and I think his ho- he, his, his rationale was that if the Kremlin knew they were in um the hands of frontline Russian soldiers, um, the Kremlin might say, "Right, I want we want these guys brought back to base for use as bargaining chips." Um, that does not necessarily spare them jail. It doesn't necessarily even spare them the death penalty long term, but it would at least stop them getting perhaps killed on the spot. Well, wow, thank you very much, um, Colin, for that. Francis, I know you had some thoughts on this story that the UK uh, Chief of Defence, um, ch- sorry, Chief of Defence Staff Admiral, this is Admiral Sir Tony Radikin, um, who said that Russia has strategically lost the war in Ukraine. This is a refrain we've heard from a few people um, over the past few months, really. I'd just like to hear your views on this, also um, given the context of, of course, advancing Russian small tactical gains uh, across the East, small as they may be. I think potentially listeners have, do have this idea that Russia is making progress. So why is uh, Sir Tony Radikin saying that Russia has strategically lost? Yeah, so we've, we've spoken about this on the podcast recently, just emphasising this point that, that, that some of the... I think commentary about the Russian advances in recent days and weeks have been, I think, somewhat misleading um, because of, you know, inevitably one one is facing a war on, on this scale. You will see back and forth. But, and, and it's it's unfortunate that, that, that those who are not following perhaps the war as closely as we are trying to haven't been able to, 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 you know, particularly those in politics, can't really see that, you know, just because you have certain signs of, of, of Russian progress doesn't mean that the bigger picture is not still calamitous for the Russians. Um, so, yes, uh, you pick up, I wanted to pick up on the remarks by, um, uh, by the Chief of Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radikin, where he essentially just underlines this point that Russia has, quote, strategically lost quote, the war in Ukraine, and is now a, quote, more diminished power, close quote, both diplomatically and economically than several months ago. And um, he goes on and, and, and in explaining why he, he thinks this. So he talks about how uh, Putin has lost 25 percent of Russia's land power, a.k.a. its, it's sort of you know, armed forces ability to, to, to fight on land. He says that whilst Russia may achieve some tactical successes in the coming weeks, like those I was just referring to, he said that any notion that war has been a success is, quote, nonsense. Um, And he talks about, of course, that NATO is now arguably stronger than it was at the beginning of the conflict, particularly with Finland and Sweden set to join. Um, Obviously, one can also talk about the, 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 the fact that the West has been rallied together by this. But also, and I just want to feed in some of the thoughts that we've brought up many times, particularly those from from Phillips O'Brien, who's who's written for our paper um, several times. Uh, the, the the you know this is now an attritional war, and in the stakes of an, when when one, can, one considers this conflict in that in that context, then uh, re- this is still very much one that favours the Ukrainian forces. They are receiving far more support, and even though things are certainly delayed at the moment, that is causing horrific casualties on the front line. Um, in an attritional style 
war, that the evidence is firmly pointed to the fact that that favours the Ukrainians. So um, this is, I think, I just wanted to make this point that that for all of the talk of, of, of gains um, that one might see in the press, that doesn't mean that the narrative should shift, because ultimately the, the Ukrainians still have far more strings in their bow if i can articulate it in that way um far more advantages bear in mind as well just it's, it's it's their territory they know it better they're still receiving um you know considerable financial support and all of these things are are, are, are attributes that russia cannot rely on um and we're already seeing as i say that that, that we, we've talked a lot about server in, in in recent days but we understand that russian forces have been severely depleted there in their attempt to control that city. Now, from the perspective of some commentators, you know, what's happening in Severodonetsk is, is being perceived and, 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 and articulated as a Russian victory. But what I'm saying is it's a Pyrrhic victory if it is one, because tactically um, it can still be perceived as, as a failure in the long run, just like, you know, on a much broader context in the Second World War, one could say that, yes, you know, certain cities were seized by the Germans um, in, in Russia. But of course, that still meant you would still say that the Russian campaign was a total disaster from the German perspective, because ultimately those territories that were taken were were, were then um, the Soviets were able to take them back. So just wanted to offer a, a sort of a, a broader context comment um, about where we are in the military stakes and perhaps to offer a, a flicker of, of, of more optimism um, than we have been seeing in, in recent days on that front. Well, thank you very much, Francis. That's very, very interesting. And I must just say quickly, of course, if you're listening live, please do uh, drop us a line with any questions or thoughts that you have. We find it extremely useful. Um, Let's go on to the, uh, well, essentially the title of this space. Um, Louis Ashworth, our economics reporter. Before, actually quickly, before we get into your your incredible story you've written about Russian oil shipping, are there any other economic updates you'd like to quickly let us us and uh, and our listeners know? Hi, David, and thanks for having me on again. Um... Well, first of all, for regular listeners, I'm going to have to disappoint everyone and say that I have no substantive updates about the prospects of a Russian default. We're very much in the sort of waiting, uh, twiddling our thumbs kind of stage at the moment, but I, I'm sure I'll be able to return soon with more information about that because I know it's a it's a hot topic. Um, it's re- relatively relatively quiet this week. Um, one interesting uh, development that we've seen today is a slight split occurring at sort of the top levels of uh, of the sort of the Russian economy about the direction that that uh, Russian prices are heading in. So we've seen basically at an event uh, today called the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, two very different views on uh, on the sort of inflation deflation question in the Russian economy. So as a quick reminder uh, for everyone, uh, prices in Russia uh, have risen very sharply in in uh, recent months. Um, it's a result of a few different factors, notably uh, Russia being cut off from substantial parts of the Western market have pushed up prices for goods because there's just less supply of things. So people are having to pay more in the shops for everyday goods because they just can't get as many of them in. Um, what we've seen though recently, um, which is to say uh, in, the, in the past couple of months, is that inflation is starting to come down and quite quite strongly come down. Now it's still extremely high. so. Annual consumer price inflation in Russia is at 16.7%, which is uh, having cu- it's, it's come off being the highest since Putin first uh, first sort of assumed power. Um, but it has been heading down, and it's pe- been heading down with enough momentum that actually there's a discussion now in Russia about whether we're seeing the beginnings of deflation. Now, I suppose everyone in the UK by now, uh, and, and America indeed, and all, all over the world, is becoming increasingly familiar with how inflation works. Inflation, most significantly, slows economic activity by making it more expensive to live in the present moment, but also um, also making people uh, you know, worry about purchases because they think things are going to get more expensive. Deflation, you have to think of in the opposite way. So deflation, the notion is that, uh, that the money you hold today is going to be worth more tomorrow. And that has various effects, one of the most notable of which is if you're thinking of buying something today and you know it's going to be more expensive tomorrow, you may well not buy that thing. You may wait and say, well, how much cheaper will it get? Um, And that's the danger of deflation because once that starts happening, economic activity slows quite strongly because people cut down on spending in that regard. So it's it's you know it's obviously the other side of the inflationary coin and it has its own has its own impacts interestingly there's a there's a schism so um uh, maxim uh Reshetnikov, who is 
uh, one of Russia's economy ministers, says that deflation is beginning and Russia's in the, in the midst of this sort of deflationary, um, uh, maybe deflationary spiral. Uh, meanwhile, Alexei Zabotkin, who is one of the deputy governors of the Bank of Russia, says it's not going to happen. Inflation is still hugely high and actually which it all it is is a product of us coming down. It's interesting that there's a split going on there because although I think we have this assumption that essentially the independence of the Central Bank of Russia has been subsumed to the Kremlin now that it's sort of in a war mode, the fact that you're still seeing sort of different views there is a reminder of the fact that although in many elements it is totalitarian and in many elements you know, the, the media is very tightly controlled, Russia is not yet a country where there is no debate about these kind of topics. And it's going to be interesting to see if if more of a schism develops there. That's fascinating. Thank you, Louis. We've just got a quick, very quick uh, question from a listener who wants to ask uh, how great an influence or not are China and India in their support towards Russia? I mean, maybe you'll get into this in, when you talk about um, uh, shipping oil. What, what do you make of that? Well, yeah, I'll definitely get onto this, particularly in the topic of, of India. Um, in the in the sort of broader sense, as a kind of pricey, and I will sort of get get into this when I talk about oil, um, the role of India in particular is very important here. Um, India has seized the opportunity of of Russian oil um, being unwelcome on large parts of the global market to bag oil at very bag is totally the wrong word. Putting oil in a bag would be ridiculous, but um, to 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 get control of oil to to. Uh, at very discounted prices. So the standard metric that we use for Russia's crude oil is uh, referred to as Urals. Um, if you compare that with Brent crude oil, which is the typically used global bench- benchmark, um, Urals is trading about $30 a barrel um, discounted to Brent, which is hugely substantial if you're a uh, if you're a company that, that consumes a lot of energy. Um, so Russia has become a, a sorry sorry apologies India has become a really big buyer of Russian oil in recent months, and that has had the had the effect of effectively fully offsetting the decline in imports from Europe. So very important in terms of um, as we've discussed before this kind of um, war chest from its exports that Russia has been able to build up and the way that effectively foreign countries have been kind of refinancing the Kremlin during this conflict. India has been India has become a big part of that. China is a little bit more complicated. I can get onto that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Louis, and thank you very much for the question. Well, let's let's get into the meat of it. Um, Russian oil and shipping shipping that oil around the world. Louis, what have you discovered? Well, there's a lot going on. So we're in a slightly interesting point of flux with with the um, oil shipping market, which is very important for um, for uh, Russia's oil sales to the world. They they ex- export a very large amount of the oil um, that they sell around the world on sh- on on tankers on these large ships rather than uh, through pipelines. There's been a lot of focus on pipelines, um, particularly because of Hungary's reliance on a pipeline and because of Nord Stream discussions around that. But uh, seaborne oil is is hugely important and integral. And what we've seen since the start of the conflict is a really big surge in activity of uh, shipping um, operators attempting to sort of disguise what they're doing when they're carrying Russian oil. And so there's a few different ways you can do this. One of the most typical ways for a Russian ship to, or, or sorry, I should say a Russia affiliated ship, because a lot of ships that will be moving Russian oil may not necessarily be Russian flagged or Russian owned. But for a ship that is Russia affiliated, carrying Russian oil, um, common trick is, is to do what's called going dark. So what this involves is you switch off a system called the automatic identification system that all ships typically run. And basically what the, what the AIS does is it sends out blips to uh, other nearby um, you know, port authorities, to other vessels, and lets them know where your ship is. If you switch it off, in theory, people don't know where you are. I'll get on in a second as to why that's only in theory. Now, ships do sometimes do this for legitimate reasons. One of the most uh, common ones is if you are going through an area where there's a lot of piracy. So it's not uncommon for ships when they're passing by, say, um, Somalia or other areas where there's been a sort of large p- pirate presence in recent history um, to switch AIS off. But that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing we're seeing Russian tankers leaving uh, from um, from in, into the Baltic Sea, switching off their systems, and then uh, you know not switching them back on until they reach uh, a faraway destination. This is clearly an attempt to to disguise what ships are doing. Now the big question 
um, with this. And, and actually, it's relevant as well to the to the other ways of sort of hiding what you're doing that I'm going to get onto is even though you can turn off your systems and uh, not be sending out a signal all the time saying, this is where I am, it's still very hard to hide a tanker ship. And uh, it's not been difficult for researchers who focus on these kind of things to keep track of the number of ships that, that are doing this. So uh, in this instance, uh, Windward, which is a consultancy, has been using AI to track uh, to track Russian vessels. And they say there's been a, a threefold increase. And you know, they are just... Uh, I mean, you know, clearly using using interesting technology, but they are just a consultancy doing this. I'm sure if you are the United States and you have a huge network of submarines and satellites, you're not going to have any problems whatsoever tracking what what any ship is doing in the uh, you know sort of in and around Europe. So it's a it's interesting that the shipping companies have have got onto doing this, and I'll get onto the reasons why shortly. Just to go through a couple of the other the other things that are going on, we're also seeing an increase in what are called ship-to-ship transfers, which is where rather than docking at a port and transferring their cargoes, ships instead meet other ships on the ocean and directly transfer their cargoes. And what that allows you to do is obfuscate a little what you're carrying, where it's going, uh, you know, who your eventual buyers are. Again, it's something that's qu- that's quite possible to track, but it does add to the um, the difficulty that authorities might have in 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 tracking you. So, for instance, if you were carrying something that uh, was considered illegal, um, by avoiding a port, you avoid it being inspected, and you can just meet up with a friendly ship, give your goods to them. They will carry on the journey to another port, and you've sort of hidden what you're doing. Um, the other big change that we're seeing is a lot of transfers of the ownership of uh, Russia-affiliated ships from Russian entities to foreign entities. Um, these have been to foreign entities in various countries, um, but there have been some in- interesting ones. In particular, um, a lot of uh, Latvian companies have popped up registering previously Russian-owned uh, owned, um, vessels. Uh, it seems, um, f- from what analysts say, it's pretty clear this is another move just to obfuscate and to make things more difficult. Now, stepping back, what we seem to be seeing here is uh, Russia preparing itself to become a but become a pariah of the of the oil moving world. Obviously, um, you know, Russia has in many ways been cut off from the Western financial system, but uh, the, the moves on oil are one of the most painful and difficult because uh, the West, in particular Europe, has been so reliable, so, so reliant upon Russian oil for so long. Um, what we see now uh, is a very notable move that occurred two weeks ago, which is that the European Union has said from the end of the year it will be illegal to transport um, Russian seaborne oil uh, you know, within and to Europe, so something needs to change basically for for Russia because they are not going to be able to use various ports. Um, that there is essentially a model that they're going to fit, and um, I'll, I'll I'll quote uh, um, Michelle um, uh, Weesey Bachman, who's a an analyst at Lloyd's List, which is a maritime intelligence group. Um, she she said to me last week that, that there's a template there for Russians to use that has been developed to prior sanction sorry in response to prior sanctions on oil shipping, and what that is is what could be perhaps called the sort of Iran Venezuela model. North Korea also it also is relevant, and what that is is that. Over recent years, due to sanctions on Iran, on on Venezuela, on North Korea, those three countries have had to figure out other ways of moving their oil. And what that has meant has basically been the creation of um, what you could call a sort of shadow fleet, which altogether represents about 2% of the global seaborne market for moving sanctioned oil. Um, So quite substantial. And this is made of a sort of hodgepodge of of vessels, many of them perhaps older vessels that were going out of service that have been bought on the cheap by people who are prepared to be involved in this kind of action, but also, um, you know, other you know, perfectly serviceable, large, serious, proper oil tankers, but that they operate outside of the regular shipping system. They, they use... They, they, they use different insurers, they use different ports, they transfer oil ship to ship, they don't, they don't reveal where they're going when they're moving. Um, and this is the model that Russia, that Russia is probably going to have to move itself into, um, presuming that 
this all goes ahead, the conflict continues, uh, the EU presses ahead with these sanctions, Russia Russia will have to find a similar way to move its oil around the world. Um, and to an extent, I think we can see the behaviour recently, um, sort of the going dark, the transfers, etc., as sort of a practice for that. It, Russian companies have essentially been getting ready for this major switchover that they're going to have to make to um, to begin sort of essentially a, a clandestine um, a clandestine oil trade, and it's it's a big it's a big difficult topic because Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, that's a significant amount of oil. Russia is is a whole whole other other level. Um, uh, another analyst, um, Eric Eric um, Brokewiesen from a consultancy called Poston and Partners, said to me, Russia is is quite an order of magnitude bigger than Venezuela and Iran. So a big thing is going to have to happen here. Russia is going to have to acquire a lot of ships. It is going to have to develop a playbook to avoid being tracked. And it is going to have to majorly adapt in response to these sanctions. So that's absolutely fascinating, Louis. Thank you so much um, for explaining that to us. Um, my, I mean, my question is, th- th- these are ingenious methods. Everything you've described is an ingenious method to in- methods to avoid the sanctions. But given that we we sort of do know that this is happening, as you've as you've laid out, what can what can the West do to to adapt to to what Russia is going to going to try and do? It's a great question, David, and it's a it's it's a weird one because as i said there's this well established fleet of of vessels that has effectively been doing this for a while i mean there is a large global trade for instance in sanctioned sanctioned iranian oil that in theory the us is opposed to and if any country in the world has the capability to stop it it is the united states because they are the world's biggest military power but these things are often allowed to operate because to stop them entirely would be to effectively introduce a new, extremely harsh level of sanctioning that may be unintentional. So from the perspective of the White House, from the perspective of US authorities, they have to consider that by, say, intervening constantly and stopping these vessels, they might be having far stronger economic consequences on Russia than they intend. And remember that Russia is going to lose a big market in Europe if this all goes ahead. And its market in India won't necessarily last. So there may be a consideration that, as well as the costs associated with having to sort of intervene, the the geopolitical headaches of what happens if you, I don't know, arrest a whole crew on a ship that is affiliated with Russia. I, I suspect there may be some sort of demonstrative actions that the US may undertake, but it's almost like you sort of wink wink nudge nudge allow this to continue to some extent um and you allow the pain to be felt in other ways so how the pain is going to be felt big, the big one is the overall volume of russian oil being shipped over sea and therefore amount of oil being shipped in total is is going to drop that they're, they're losing clients they're losing europe india can only to some extent uh um, make up for that loss, and Russia Russia doesn't want to be to be selling its oil on the cheap forever. So, what's likely to happen from this is uh, it becomes less viable for Russia to produce as much oil as it does. It will then cut production. Uh, it will then lose money. So, so that's kind of how the sanctions hit. And you don't necessarily then need to be intervening the ships, in, intervening with the ships that are going out in order to stop that having an effect. Um, the other side of this is, uh, and a very significant part of this EU ban coming in, is that uh, with the cooperation of the UK, uh, Russia is also now being cut out of the global markets for shipping insurance, which is hugely integral because uh, the, the shipping industry is extraordinarily complicated, complicated and involves a lot of different moving pieces um, and uh, interaction between international jurisdictions. It's very risky. Uh, there are so many things that can go wrong whilst you're at sea. Um, insurance is integral. And by freezing Russia out of the West's sort of major established insurance markets, they're also pushing costs up there. So it, it, it is an effective way of sanctioning, even if you don't go so far as to actually sort of put up a barrier um, and, and, uh, and stop stop ships from actually leaving Russia. And just before, I know Francis must have a 
a load of questions as well. But how does how does China fit into all of this, or, or does it not really? China is a fascinating one, and is really important for this. Um, China, as far as we can see, broadly, has not, in volume terms, stepped up its imports of Russian oil, particularly since the conflict started. It's because there's been a lot of interaction between China and Russia and uh, they've made a lot of pledges to economically support each other, there's this misconception that also all Russian oil is going to China. That, that isn't true. And India is the more significant one in terms of where the, the shortfall to Europe has been made up. But a lot, of this, a lot of this ship-to-ship transfer activity that I've been talking about, a lot of the time ships have conducted transfers and then headed off to China. And what that actually means is, in aggregate, we... We don't know for sure how much oil is going to China. It's possible that that there is a kind of um, black market back channel going to going to China that we can't fully monitor just yet. So to some extent, this is hidden. But in a very broad sense, it doesn't look yet like China has has become a big net buyer. Now, the important thing to note there is that. Russian, Russian, uh, you know, there's the Russian side to this, and then there is the Chinese side. And we have to remember that in China, uh, coinciding effectively with the conflict have been these major lockdowns, you know, uh, lockdowns in Beijing, the capital, lockdowns in Shanghai, which is the sort of huge manufacturing hub. Um, these will also have affected the dynamic. And one of the things that sort of remains to be seen and will become apparent um, in the sort of coming weeks and months is whether as China tries to reopen, which is it's having problems with anyway at the moment, whether that then creates a boom in, in Russian oil going to China and whether China does then ride to the rescue. As so far as things have been, you know, since uh, since late February, it's been sort of disguised by that combination of factors. Um, Francis, do you want to jump in at this point? What questions do you have for Louis? Yeah, it's just, just to pick up on what Louis was saying there about China, I think it's been interesting that there have been perhaps more signs of overtures in support from China towards Russia in the past sort of 48, 72 hours um, than we have seen prior to now. And I think probably part of that is because of these perceived Russian successes, as we were talking about earlier on. But it was absolutely fascinating hearing Louis talk about Russian shadow fleets and, and the sort of creative accounting that's been going on on this issue of, of Russian oil. Um, I suppose my, my first first question really is obviously there have been several european powers that have been perhaps guilty of buying um some of this shady oil um what's your view on the political will and perhaps even the sort of pl- political capability of of europe to actually see through these kind of embargo measures um that they are currently saying that they intend to stick to thank you francis yeah so so as as you said there um there have been, you know, in, in the in the broad in the broad sense, there's been sort of you know this d- disgusted reaction to to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There's been a lot of self sanctioning. A lot of companies have acted outside of the demands of states to um, to sort of cut off relations with Russia. Um, in the case of shipping of oil, uh, that has uh, not been the case with all companies. So, in particular, what we've seen is a really big jump in. Uh, in vessels owned that are um, owned, managed, or flagged in in Greece, Cyprus, or Malta, um, picking up Russian oil. So that kind of activity um, from the start of the conflict until uh, sort of middle of May, which I think is when I have the latest data for, um, has tripled. So a big increase there. There have been plenty of um, of shipping uh, shipping magnates, large shipping companies in in those Mediterranean countries that have probably made some, some very good money picking up picking up the uh, the sort of slack where where others have have said no yeah we, we, we won't we won't touch that um I mean this is this has drawn some con- some condemnation um uh, global witness the human rights NGO um one of their one of their um, campaigners said to me you know if, if, if that's not profiteering I'm not quite sure what is um Another analyst said to me, uh, you know, right now, the fear is low, greed is high. So people are not worried that they're going to get in trouble for doing this, so they're willing to do it. One thing I should state at this point categorically is that uh, it is it is generally against, it's against maritime law, um, insofar as maritime law is something that is, that is well enforced to turn off your tracking systems. Um, it's not 
it's it's illicit but not illegal to transfer goods between ships. Um, a lot of these things that can occur at sea, um, uh, the problem where it really occurs, and this sort of gets perhaps the answer to your question, Francis, is you you hit a problem once you hit the ports. You can you can do a lot of things whilst you're out on the ocean um, that are you know that are problematic that disguise what you're doing uh, that the, you know obfuscate the, the where you're going and what you're what you're taking um but once you hit the once you hit the ports themselves there is a far bigger presence of of governments there is a uh, it's, it's much harder to um, avoid detection so essentially the challenge for Europe if it wants to enforce this is is not how well can it can it um safeguard its oceans necessarily it's how well can it safeguard its ports yeah. and how much control can it exercise there um i would say doubtless someone will say uh, someone someone in europe is going to say i can get i can get russian c1 oil for 30 30 dollars a barrel less than i'd be able to get it on the global market i'm going to smuggle some russian oil into europe there, there will be someone somewhere who who is who's going to do that i have no doubt whatsoever, because where there is money to be made, people will, uh, you know, do whatever they can. Um, but in the broad, it should, I believe, be possible because because you know these are major vessels. They generally have to operate through major ports. You can't kind of, um, in the same way, you know, if if, if you if you're running a sort of drug smuggling operation or a uh, or or arms smuggling it's easier to hide what you're doing because you're not moving such big quantities but to move an oil tanker with sort of the levels of oil that are needed you know, if, if you're going to move more than just a full barrels it's a very hard thing to disguise and you have to be working within major infrastructure so i would say m the the view and this is sort of shared by analysts i've spoken to is that as long as you can basically sort of defend the ports you can make this work Thank you. That's so that's so interesting. Um, my uh, my second question is just mo much broader, really, about the state of the Russian economy, because obviously we've heard from you several times talking about and, and updating very helpfully on what's what's been going on there. But just for the benefit of 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 those listeners who haven't been able to follow the whole picture and the first the, sort of the last thing they heard the russian economy was on the state of, a, of collapse you know the ruble was in free fall what what's the cycles that we've seen since then how is it that a country like russia that has engaged in this horrific um I I invasion and is facing all of these embargoes and and with you know and loads of countries pulling out uh, businesses and things like that how is it that their that their economy still at least on the face of it seems to be operating effectively or is it not is that all just a facade well i think the first thing to say is that for for russia there is going to be a heavy growth cost from this war. So we're still expecting Russia's economy to shrink. I mean, estimates vary. I, I'm, I think the OECD, which is a sort of think tank club of rich nations organization, um, uh, I, th I think 8.9% put, put was the figure they put on how much they expect Russia's economy to decline, which will have real world effects that, you know, that's a severe drop. Um, it's on a sort of you know, pan pandemic level scale. Um, so there, there is a material impact there, um, which in some ways may be hard to see because it's not, especially because we're going to see the effects of this being distributed quite broadly. It's going to be sort of a case of every single individual Russian tends to suffer and we'll see some, some, in, some you know, sections of industry completely collapse because they're reliant on relations with the West. But it's not a kind of the entire economy sort of chasms type situation. It's, it's a sort of big broad hurt but in a way that's kind of hard to pin down in some ways um with uh with regards to um the the, the ruble which we discussed before so what's happened with the ruble essentially um and it's sort of been it's been kind of clear from the beginning that that uh, you know for, for joe biden to have a kind of um a sort of uh symbolism that involved saying the ruble is weak means russia is weak was never a good idea because russia is this export superpower and what happens is there are always there's always a huge amount of foreign currency going into Russia because they sell so much fuel in particular abroad. Um, so that has allowed the ruble to recover. The situation we're now in is the ruble has kind of got too strong and we're seeing uh, Russia's central bank having to cut rates in order to try and take some strength out of that. Um, some of these factors are still developing. I mean, I, I spoke earlier about um, about deflation. Um, 
having a strong ruble and having the ruble be so strong that it's difficult to control um, can add to deflationary pressures because if you find your currency being suddenly more valuable, um, it, it again makes goods from overseas cheaper um, and, and it, adds, it adds to deflation. So it's going to be interesting to see how that discussion goes. Um, uh, so uh, overall, I think it, it's a hard thing to sum up, to sum up quickly. Um, it, Russia is strong enough and self-reliant enough that it can't be economically destroyed by by simply being heavily sanctioned by the West. But I think we are seeing the onset of of effects that will cause long-term pain for its economy. It's going to have it's going to have long-term problems controlling its currency. Um, it's going to hit a point at which it's difficult for the central bank to um, intervene too much to to weaken the ruble because uh, once they once they do so, um, they will risk uh, sort of losing losing control over inflation if they do have another inflationary shock. Um, we're going to see long term damage from these fuel embargoes. A lot of these things will kind of add up, but the the notion of a kind of the immediate short sharp hit that knocks out Russia, I think was was misguided from the beginning and and we're probably at the point where we should be accepting a kind of slower more attritional um uh impact from from everything that the west is doing well thank you so much louis ashworth for your time that was absolutely fascinating um i'm afraid we've got to the end of our time here as well so can i just ask uh, francis and louis for your final thoughts francis would you like to go first Yes, well, I just wanted to flag one story um, that we've reported on in the paper today, and it connects with some other stories that we've covered on the podcast previously. And that is that we understand that Russia have been accused of abducting 2,000 vulnerable Ukrainian children and facilitating forced adoptions of them in Russia. Uh, and the reason we know this is that the UK has announced some fresh sanctions against those believed to be involved in this practice. And we already know from May when Russia said that it has taken in more than 190,000 children from the Donbass, including about 1,200 from orphanages. We already know that, that this is a major practice that I would say is probably fairly underreported, actually, that there has been a huge number of people who have been taken from Ukraine. And of course, many of those will be perceived as being uh, hostile to the Russian regime and have been you know, hidden away in uh, across the country. There are expectations it could be even as high as a million people from Ukraine may now be in Russia and under imprisonment. And but then there's obviously this uh, this other thing going on, which is that these these children are being kidnapped, and Russia have even said that, and this is this is their perspective on it, um, that the vast majority are Russian speaking or supporting, hmm, and that once they were found, they, they that once they've found homes, they'll be provided with Russian citizenship. So this is clearly an attempt to integrate Ukrainian citizens who are young. Um, into the Russian state in the hope that they will see these territories that have been seized by Russia as as being legitimate Russian territory. I mean, it's it's pretty sickening stuff, really, to be honest. But I wanted to flag it as a final thought because I think this is a big story that because it's happening so secretively and because they're obviously arriving on Russian soil, we are not able to to, to interview these people, to speak to them so easily. And so, but it, it is a big score story and obviously a, a scandal if as many as a million people are now in, uh, have, have been taken by the Russian state against their will. So um, one to watch, I would say. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, Louis Ashworth, would you like the, the final the final words here? Sure. Uh, I'm probably going to have to sort of speak in kind of vague terms here because it's going to be somewhat of a more philosophical point than a specific economic one. But uh, one thing that we've been tracking very closely this week is uh, the behaviour of sort of central banks around the world. It's been a sort of major, major week for central banks. So uh, we saw the European Central Bank held an emergency meeting on Wednesday to look at trying to close uh, close. Uh, bond spreads in Europe. We saw that that evening the Federal Reserve in the United States raised interest rates by 75 basis points, uh, three quarters of a percentage point, which was the biggest jump since 1994. Um, yesterday on Thursday, the Bank of England raised interest rates again, the fifth time in a row. They're now the highest since the financial crisis. 
And uh, today we've seen the the Bank of Japan in sort of uniquely Bank of Japan style uh, do nothing and just say we, we we don't want to raise rates, which is it's kind of the same thing. But uh, it's just interesting in terms of we're seeing very very much so that that Russia uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has has added to this inflationary pressure around the world. It's it's really up the ante on central bankers um, to to react and try and raise the cost of borrowing to slow their respective economies and therefore attempt to slow inflation. Um, this is a big seismic thing that that's occurring and it's having major effects on financial markets as well, um, which have sold off heavily on the sort of expectation that the the kind of the the, the cheap and easy money that's been sloshing around markets since the pandemic hit is is being sort of sucked away it's it's drying up and that is having majorly damaging effects on markets this is to some extent a lot of this was happening before the conflict but to some extent this is a corollary of of the conflict in ukraine and i think it's gonna be very interesting i'm not sure i have like a a sharp point to make here necessarily but it's gonna be very interesting to watch in the coming weeks and months how the country's sort of domestic situations and this financial fallout on the west that's occurring is going to affect the discourse around Ukraine, uh, because I would not be surprised if there are there are those who would like to would like to push for a resolution to the conflict from a position that is motivated not by what's best for Ukraine, not by what's best for Europe, not not by you know what, what does what does Russia deserve, but instead by what is going to take the heat off me the most at home, and and it's already this is a big pressure but it's going to be an interesting one to watch because the as much as we can talk about the economic consequences for russia itself this conflict has had big economic consequences for the rest of the world as well ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the telegraph to stay on top of all of our ukraine news analysis and dispatches from the ground subscribe to the telegraph you can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly with us by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. And today on Twitter, Sophie Coe. 